Okay. Oh. Move this way. Okay. He's fixing something in the back. It seems a little better. But you're on. You ready? Yes. All right. So tonight's brand new hot off the press class is going to kill our ears. <laughs> Okay, it's called Store This, Not That. And the reason why I'm doing this class is, for a lot of reasons, but one of them is I have people all the time emailing me and asking me about different products and what they should get and if this is good or bad. So we're going to be covering a lot of different things tonight. And I thought that these pictures were pretty good because Especially when you're shopping the food store, sometimes you just feel like you don't even know what to get because there's so much stuff out there. Okay. Okay, so food storage. Lots of times I get people that tell me this is how they feel about food storage. It is confusing. It is, I like this lady. It's frustrating and it is overwhelming. How many of you feel at least one of those things? Okay, I think we all have, in fact, I do at certain points in my life. Right now, I'm feeling pretty good, but, you know, there's always next week. So, last month, we talked about Noah and building our ark one level at a time, right? So, I want you to keep that in mind tonight, because we are going to now talk exclusively about food and water storage tonight, and do it by levels, because I want you to work on them by levels, and not try to think you have to do it all at one time, because then you really won't get
May God bless us to be prepared for the days which lie ahead, which may be the most severe yet. That was in 1980. <coughs> Think how much worse things have gotten just in the last few years. All right. So, reasons why we don't prepare. I don't, I don't mean we, but you know, in general. All right. Number one, it won't happen. Whatever it is, it's not going to happen. 91% of the people in the United States live in areas where some kind of big disaster can happen. Next thing is, if it does happen, it won't happen to me. Oh, it's going to happen to the other guy. If it does happen to me, it won't be that bad. Now look at this lady talking on her phone. This is what her house looks like. It did happen to her. If it does happen to me and it's bad, there's nothing I can do about it anyway. Well, we know that that's not true. There are always these things that you can do to prepare to make it better for you and your family. Okay, so FEMA and Red Cross say that if an earthquake, hurricane, winter storm, or other disaster strikes your community, you might not have access to food, water, and electricity for days or even weeks. By taking some time now to store emergency food and water supplies and cooking supplies, you can and provide for your entire family. So this is our goal tonight. This is part one of what we're going to be talking about. Okay, so there was a survey that was taken after Hurricane Katrina in the area, you know, in, around, and it, only 16% of the people said that they were prepared for something to happen. No one was amazing to me. On the East Coast, they've had storm after storm the last few years, and every time another storm is coming, you see the lines at the grocery store and the shelves empty because they don't have food. Have they not learned? Come on. Okay, so the question is, when disaster strikes, are you going to be one of the 16%? I hope that you are, and not one of the 84. Okay, so, level one is your emergency food. This is what you start with, okay? Um, emergency food, I believe, divided into two different sections. 72-hour kit food and two to four week food. Emergency food, okay? We're gonna go over each of those. All right, so, this is a store this. In the olden days, they used to eat something called, does anyone know what this is? Hardtack, okay? Hardtack is basically like glue in a biscuit form, and it actually would break people's teeth. It has a lot of really funny nicknames because of it, and if you'll notice, it has a lot of holes because it was really prone to get bugs also. That's where they picked up their extra protein from, no problem. So, this is what, in the olden days, you would have to store for your Sunday targets, and that's what they took when they went on trips, is hardtack. Now, we have a lot of other kinds of things that work the same kind of way. And we're going to talk about why I think this is the store this for 72 hours for your 72 hour kids. I've seen, and I'm sure you all have seen, all kinds of fancy dancy little gimmicky things that they put together for 72 hour kids for their food. And frankly, they take up half of your 72 hour kit. And frankly, I would rather have other things in there besides just food. And most of them, coincidentally, happen to be very salty on top of it, which I think is so funny. So, these have these kind of bars, and up here is your desserts. We have all of the bars, so you can come up and try them to see which one you like. Um, they're all a little bit different, but they all have the same things in common. They all, for a three-day supply, cost under $10. Most of them are under $6 for a three-day supply. They are only about the size of a paperback novel for a three-day supply. They are all non-thirst provoking. And I had to figure out what that was because it sounded so weird to me. But basically what it means is they're very low in salt, so they don't make you thirsty. So you can drink them, and even though they're kind of dry, they just stay with you and they don't make you thirsty. And that's not what you want when you're having to look at your water. They Okay. They also all have, um, they all can resist are really good for high heat and low heat. So you can keep them in 72 hour kits in your cars, and they're gonna be able to store for five years, and it won't affect the taste or the, you know, how good they are for you, which is a really big deal because most things don't do that well. Okay, yes. They're called survival bars. So there's a whole bunch of different kinds. There's, yeah. most of them required rations from Right, so most of them, and because of that, you will find that they are 
Coast Guard certified. That means that they hold up to the high P. It means that they have they have um, all the things that we just talked about. They fall into those categories. So they are all of them are sold by Emergency Essentials, with the exception of ER bars. And frankly, they're my least favorite, so it doesn't really matter. But I will tell you that the first time we did a taste test, I did this with a friend of mine, and she and I pretty much liked all the same ones. Her husband, and there's one that we spit out because we thought it was so disgusting. And he came in, and that was his favorite. No. And so, yeah. So it's really important. Oh, wait, two more things. They're, they have, they're full of energy. They're high in carbs, and they do have fiber in them. They are, and they taste like cookies, most of them. My favorite is the mainstay. To me, that is the score, this one for me, because it tastes like shortbread. And I can eat the whole package in one sitting, all 3,600 calories without a problem, <laughs> um, except the whole calorie part. So, so we want to store these other things and not store the hard tack. Okay? So, come up and taste them after. Now, what I'm proposing that you do, because doesn't like my little story, everybody in your family is going to like something different. And you want them to have something in the pack that they like. So I suggest you can buy these in like one day, one day rations and, or three days. This is three days. This is a one day one. Um, so they're cheaper to get them in the one day ones. And you can get them to get together with a couple other families and, you know, taste them all and figure out what everybody likes. Okay. So, a not that. How many of you have MREs as part of your food storage? Okay. Okay, go ahead. Put your hands up. I know that you do. Okay. Um, all right. So MREs, I went to a class and learned that MREs are really not good for you, and I really had a hard time thinking that because so many people buy them. And I, so I've done my own research and now realize you really don't want MREs. So let me tell you about MREs. First of all, they are they were designed for the army men that are on the go, that are putting out a lot of energy. They are very, very, very high in salt, mm -hmm. and they have no fiber. I mean, pretty much no. Like the whole day, they have like two grams or whatever they do fiber oil. Okay, you're supposed to have like 30 and they have like two. Because of that, it can cause severe stomach pro um, stomach problems and severe constipation. Okay? You do not want to feel like that, especially if you're going on a little porta potty somewhere. Okay. So the other thing that I found out about them is when they make MREs in the army, you get that's just the main meal, right? A lot of people just have main meals in their semi targets. They are designed that every part of the whole thing, the crackers and the jelly and the drink and all that, all have a little bit of the nutrition. So if you're only eating the MRE part, you're not getting all the nutrition. You're only getting a little part of it. And there is a story that I have a link to, I think, in my on my website in one of my other classes about these guys who ate these and ended up just, I can't even tell you what happened to them, but just let me tell you, we don't want to eat MREs for very long enough. Okay, so the other thing about MREs to me is they really don't look very good or taste, I don't think they taste very good, so why would you store that when you have other options? Okay, another not that is like things like you normally see in normally 72 our kids are like granola bars, any kind of granola bar or jerky, um, you can also make homemade ones. The homemade ones, they are like the size of a brick, and you need three of those for three days. Okay, that's like six pounds just worth of that, and it doesn't even look very good. The pink one has jello in it, okay? It doesn't, doesn't even sound good to me. Okay, um, there is, for those of you that have gluten intolerant or vegan people in your family, there is one called the Original Survival Bar that is vegan gluten free, but for a three day supply, it's $33. Okay? It's a lot of money. So, you have to decide. And all of these do not store well in high heat or cold. And they only store, even in good temperatures, about six months. So, you have to be constantly rotating these if you have them as part of your, of your seven targets. Okay. There's more, but I'm going to Okay. Okay, for water for your 72 hour kit, um, how much water are you supposed to store a day? Who knows? In an emergency room. Two gallons, okay? One gallon weighs eight pounds. Oh, actually, 8.3. So that's a three day supply is 25 pounds, which is about all I want in my backpack to begin with, just for your water. So I did some research and found out that you can get by on um, a pint, um, 
one and a half, pint and a half, no, three pints, three pints, one and a half gallons, it's three pints. Okay, you one can get by quarts. on three pints. One and a half quarts. One and a half quarts. Of course. Okay, but it's pints. So it's six pints. You can get by, you can get by with six pints. You have to change that. Okay. You have six pints of Yes, I know. The pictures are right. The wording is wrong. Okay, so look at the pictures. All right, these are my store this for water. My personal preference is just to get these. Okay, it's like 20 cents for my three-day supply of water. The one that is the pouches are, you need 20 four of them in your pack and it's like eleven dollars. Okay, I can do twenty cents or I can do eleven dollars. The other thing about these is when you open them, I actually opened one and drank it because I wanted to see what it was like. That's kind of first day when I did right now. Um, but when you open it, it's it's hard to drink. There's no straw. So you have to like pour it in and not spill it and things like that. One of the handy things about them though is they do store for five years even in the heat and they um, because they're so like flexible, they fit good in your backpacks and you know you can get rid of them as you go along. A bad thing about them is if you find other water, you know, you can't like keep other fresh water in your work. These I can refill with my hand and dandy little thing. Okay. If you keep it in car, rotate it. Especially in car feet. Yes. Yes. I have plastic bottles in my very first 72 hour kit. The, the heat in the car degraded and yes. the leaks all over Yes, they do. The you have to really rotate them if they're in your car. Like every month, you want to rotate them just because they taste weird too. And they do. What? Do the pouches store well heat? Yes. The pouches do store well heat. Yeah. Yes, I'm not going into the chemicals and plastic. I have my handy dandy filter that I can filter my water if I'm worried about that. And frankly, I would be dead. I'd rather drink the water than be dead. So. Yeah. Right. That's why you're going to rotate. Okay. But I still think it's worth my 20 cents, you know, rather than my $11. Just personally up to you. I don't like the boxes. They are expensive also, and I don't like them just because I, they can get poked, you know, they can break open, they're not as sturdy as some of the other things. These are also not puncture resistant. Well, none of those are puncture resistant, so I guess I just know. But anyway, so it's just up to you, but those are the three top things. There's really not a lot of other ways to store water in your backpack. So you got to pick one of them, pick the one that you like. All right, the knot, the store knot, is you don't want to store it in any time in water jugs because they do leak. I just had one leak all over the top of my uh, my washing machine this week. But it only been up there like three months or six months. So they don't leak. Okay, now, in addition to having water stored, now we already talked about how that's not really enough water to get you by, especially if you're having to walk. So you need to be prepared. Hopefully you'll come upon some water somewhere, but you cannot trust that it's going to be safe to drink. So you have to have a way to treat it. So there, this is a big murky bottle, which I like. It has this cool little swell that pops off the top. Um, they also, Saint Shell also has them that the church sells for $22. That'll do um, 200 gallons of water. And they take out the taste, they make it taste good. You do want to have like a bandana in your backpack, so if you do come upon some pretty disgusting water, you want to pre filter it through that so it doesn't clog up your filter. You also are going to, no matter what kind of filter you have, you're going to want to treat your water just to make sure you've killed all the buggies in it. And so um, this gets rid of the taste and the look and chemicals, but it doesn't do a lot for, um, does for the big buggies, but not for the little ones. So you want to kill them. There's three kinds. This is an iodine base, this is a bleach base, and that is a chlorine dioxide, which is not bleach, it's a different kind of thing. But um, I like that one. These first two take four hours. You have to let it sit for four hours before you drink it. That one only takes 15 to 20 minutes, so I like that one better. But, yeah. Yes. Yes. You can do stereo pins too. There are, there's lots of options out there. You just, you know, you have to look and see what works for you. These are the things that I think they store the easiest. I don't have to worry about batteries with them. And, you know, they're just in there. They store for four to five years. So, that's what I'm going with. So, your 72-hour kit action plan. I'm not ready to do this. Okay. Um, you want to try then buy the food for your 72-hour kits. You want to um, then buy your emergency water and make sure you put dates on it so you know when you need to rotate it. Put them in 
your kids and put your kids either in your car, in your office, in your closets, wherever you're keeping your kids, or more than one kit, make sure that they're there. I personally like cars because pretty much any place I am, my car is. And so even if I'm traveling out of state, I still got it with me. And you never know when something's going to happen. You know, you can go down below for something, you never know. And then you want to add um, some kind of water filter and treatment to your thing. The cost for all of that is between $12 and $32 per person. So not that much, very doable. First step, get it done. You've got one thing checked off your list. All right, emergency food and water. Now, if you do not have emergency food and water already stored, then you get to be like these silly people that don't, that probably live in the east somewhere, and um, have to go stand in line and wait. And hopefully, by the time you get inside, there's still something left on the shelves. <clears throat> However, lots of times there's not, and it might not be stuff you really like, like, you know, the prunes are left. Okay, you also, if you're lucky, you might have the FEMA or Red Cross come to your neighborhood and you can go stand in line there and wait for some food. But from what I hear from like Sandy, that didn't happen very often. So um, you can't really count on that. You also, if you haven't prepared, will have to stand in line with water. And that means having some kind of container to take your water home in, and then you still have to have a way to sometimes to treat it, depending on where you're getting the water from. If you have prepared with your emergency food and water, which I'm hoping you're going to be one of the 16%, then you can sit around by candlelight or lamplight or whatever and eat your delicious food and have your water and not have to go out and be in the crowd or anything else. And you can go to the party. Okay, you know, hurricane party is really not so much here. Okay, so food for the next two weeks would include, okay, but first of all, I couldn't get it if someone eating one of these bars because I couldn't find a picture. But even I, who love the mainstay bars, would get sick of them and after a few days would be ready for some real food. So we're going to enter the real food realm now. Um, when disasters do happen, there's usually lots of things to keep you busy. Not only that, but your adrenaline is running and a lot of times you're not even, that's why these are great for the first three days because I don't know how many of you have been in some real disaster. Even like somebody in your house, in your family that's in the hospital, you're not really thinking about eating, but you still need the nutrition, especially if you're having to dig through things. So these are great for that because you can do them on the run. But you're going to want some other kinds of food at this point. So you want foods that are just open, add water, heat meat. Okay, that's what this section right here is. Things that I can just eat cold if I had to. Well, they're not all eat cold if I had to, but. I could soak them in the water and let them soak for a while, and I could eat them, but I didn't have anything to keep them up with. We're going to get to that in a minute. You want to have at least one filling meal a day. So have at least one of your meals be enough, and you're going to get full. All right, so some ideas. You can either get prepackaged things. These are a bunch of ideas that you can use for your, you know, open heat meat. Now some of these you will put them on the heat, so that would mean cooking. This is also the perfect place for um, freeze-dried meals because you just add water and heat meat. Okay, it's called in our category. But this is the only thing that I think that these are good for. And we're going to talk in a few minutes about why I think that. All right, so for your two to four weeks, you can get things like that. For any of them, you want to make sure that you're trying them first to make sure your family actually likes them before you store them. And because if they don't like that, they're not going to eat it. So you don't want to store the stuff that your family doesn't like. All right. Part two is to do homemade MMEs. Those made easy kind of thing. Things that we talked about that are all, you know, together that you basically can dump in something, add some water, heat, and meat, okay? But do it ahead of time so it's all organized and you've got it and you don't have to worry about it. There's everything on there from breads to, you know, main meals. I don't remember what that is. Let's take a sip. I should have had a breakfast on there. But anyway, you get the idea, right? So there's two different things. Buy them your package or do them yourself. I mean, you can just get like big cans of ravioli if you want to do that. But they're harder to rotate if you're not used to it. If you don't eat them all the time. All right, emergency water. Whereas it would be really nice to turn on your faucet and have your water come out like this after an earthquake, usually it comes out looking like this. Water you probably do not want to drink. And so that is why it is important to have two weeks worth of water, at least two weeks worth of water stored. So storage amounts per person per day. On an average day, an average person uses between 
70 and 100 gallons of water per day. Now we just talked about having two gallons of water a day, which seems like a lot for a 72 hour kit, right? But it's really not that much water. You really have to ration it. So, for drinking and cooking, you're going to want half a gallon to a gallon. For sanitation and hygiene, a half a gallon to a gallon. And at some point, you're probably going to have to wash some clothes. You'll need an extra five gallons per, <coughs> per person for that. All right? So that is adding up to some water now, right? More than the 14 gallons that he will want you to store. So, um, these are some ways that you can store water. The five gallon container, you would need three of those per person. You would need five cases of water per person. Um, you need, I think, about seven of the two gallon ones, and that particular kind of thing is as hard, so you can store in those. And those are, you know, two liter bottles. You can store water in those as long as you wash them out. You need like 56 of them per person for the two weeks. That's a lot of water to store. I'm just imagining where I would store all that. It would be difficult. So, my choice, my store this is. 55 gallon drum per person. Okay, that's about a month's supply of water. That gives you a little bit of leeway, so you're not having to, you know, be quite so tight with your water. It also gives you a little bit of water that you can share with some other people if you need to do that. Um, my, not, don't store that. Don't store, not that. My not that, that's what it is, right? Not that, is drinking water cannot be stored in bleach bottles, soap bottles, or pools. There are certain kinds of um, filters that will filter pool water for drinking, but they're expensive and you usually have to have some kind of electricity or some kind of fuel. So just think of it as bathing water or washing water and not so much drinking water. And not only that, but if you've ever lived through a place where there's been an earthquake and there's pools, the water all sloshes out. Mm -hmm. And not only that, if you don't have electricity to run your filter, your water is going to be not so good looking in a few days. So, think about all that. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about barrels here. This is one of the things I thought about cutting, but I'm always getting these questions to this. So, used versus new. I recommend only getting new because new barrels have not had any food product in them, which means no bacteria can grow in them unless something's been introduced. Used barrels you can use, you can wash them. Um, to wash them, you want to fill them about a quarter of the way full of water. You put a cup of bleach in, you're going to roll it around the yard about four times a day for a couple days so it gets all nice and cleaned and bleached out. Rinse it out really good and then fill it up with a preserver. We're going to talk about those in a minute. But your water will eventually smell and taste like whatever was stored in it before. Right? So imagine something. I know people that have girls that have had soy sauce in them. <laughs> You know, soy sauce, oatmeal just doesn't sound that good to me. So, you need, and because whatever was in them has leached into the plastic, it leaches back and you can have bacterial growth. That's why used barrels need to be rotated every year and new barrels only need to be rotated every five years. Some people believe that you don't ever need to rotate new barrels as long as they're sealed up because no bacteria can get in, so nothing can grow, so your water will be safe. Okay, so it's worth it to me to spend the extra money to get the new barrel and not have to worry about what to learn and then my family's going to get sick. If you're going to use, use water in these barrels, I strongly suggest you have a really good filter and a way to treat that water before you drink it. Just to be sure. Okay, so filling and storing barrels. You need to either use plastic or the, these are called dripping water safe hoses. The green hoses have are made from recycled rubber and they're toxic for us to drink. And so um, you're not supposed to ever use those that as a store not, um, or not this. So you want to fill it with the cleanest water possible. Leave one, one to four inches of room at the top for expansion in case it freezes. My husband thinks that they would never freeze here, but I'm not willing to take the chance, so. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Okay, so um, you want to store it in the shade, covered, and off the ground. The reason you want them covered is the first thing to go on your barrels will be the little plastic button things that are that tighten down, and if they crack, you're now your water's um, contaminated. So um, if you keep them covered, it helps with that. So we already talked about filling them. All right, so as far as additives, yeah. Why do you have to put them Okay, I'm going to tell you what I've read. 
I have not ever read anything that I'm convinced of what they're telling me is the truth, but every place I've ever read about spurn out the ground says the same thing. Stuff that's in the ground can reach into them. Also, they're more apt to freeze if they're sitting right on the ground with their cement. They want air space underneath them. So that's all I'm going to tell you. I don't know, but that's what I'm telling you that they say. Okay, as far as used barrels go, you would put four tablespoons of bleach in. Why? Because there's more bacteria in a used barrel. In a new barrel, you would only put four teaspoons in for the whole thing. You also can use um, aerobic stabilized oxygen, which is a more natural way, or um, water preserver, both of them. Say that they you can store your water for five years with those in and not have to change your water out. But like we talked about with the new barrels, you shouldn't have to do that anymore. All right. Store this other knees. A bum wrench, that's what opens and closes the top of your barrels tightly so that you don't get any kind of organisms in there. Um, a siphon hose or a pump, you need to get your water out somehow. You also are going to want some kind of portable dispenser unless you're planning on moving that 450 pound barrel into your house. You want something to put it into your brain in the house. I like these square ones because you can put it on your sink like a faucet. It has a little faucet to turn on and off. It's really handy to use. And they're stackable and they're portable. So if you need it to go, you can take it and you know, go with you. And that's a five day supply of water for one person. For one of those. All right, so eating when the power's off. Let's say you have tuna helper as part of your, your, your emergency food. If you do not have a way to heat it, then you would be eating like dry noodles with some cheese sauce sprinkled on top. That's a really sound that appetizing. Okay. If you have a way to cook it, you can have some wonderful casserole and some biscuits go with it. So we're going to talk just briefly. This is the class we're doing in June. We're doing two classes in June that have to do with the no power cookers. So I'm just going to show you. If you have a gas stove and your gas lines are safe and there's no explosions in the area, you can actually use your gas stoves. Even if you have, you can, you know, light them manually. You need to do that to cook on. Um, you can use camping stoves. That is a great way to do emergency cooking. Um, propane or gas or whatever they are. You can use your charcoal grill or charcoal. You can use your charcoal grill actually. Charcoal grill or your propane grills. Um, they do go through fuel fairly quickly when you're just warming things up like you're going to do on them. Um, you can use over a campfire, or you can use things like rocket stoves, or solar cooking, or I don't think, oh, I didn't have it on here, or an apple box oven, that's where you can this gets in. So anyway, any of those. We're going to talk about those later, but just think, you want to think about some way to be able to cook your food. I don't care how you do it, do it, and get it to a floor too. OK, so action goals. Gather two to four weeks of emergency food. Um, gather two to four weeks of emergency water. And the reason I'm saying two to four weeks, most people say two weeks. But I've been hearing stories coming out of Sandy that, you know, three to four weeks later, they're still without running water. They're still without electricity in a lot of those places. So, and they're still under a lot of stress. So you want things that are going to be really easy to fix in those kind of situations. All right. Um, you want to gather your no power cookers and fuel and practice using your cookers. Practice cooking for some of this stuff so when things happen, you don't have to try to find the instructions to learn how to light that stove that you never had in the first few years. Um, you also don't forget the manual can openers and don't forget the matches. Okay, level two. We're going to run along here. <coughs> okay. All right, level two is your 90 day supply. These should be things that are simple, one pot, and storable. Things like this in your pantry fresh things from your refrigerator or your garden, and, um, oh, things in your freezer. <laughs> I told that picture was. Okay, and things from your freezer. Now, most of you are going to wonder why I say freezer. We're going to get into that just a minute, because at first I was very much busy. But, let's face it, how many of us in our lifetimes have had to live off of our emergency food? Probably not very many of us. Okay. Okay, a few of you. All right, but most of us, you know, most 98% of our lives are use, using regular food, our regular menus, things out of our freezer. So that's why these other things are important. Because there are a lot of life's little emergencies. So there are things like, you know, a young mom with four little kids hanging on them, who just at the end of the day just has no energy to make dinner, but her family still needs to eat. How nice would it be to have a simple one-pot storable thing to 
be able to pull out, add something to, and you know, in half an hour have dinner on the table. You have, I used to have this, I had three kids that were playing two or three sports each at the same time in junior high and high school, and I was constantly inviting them to practices during the time that I needed to make dinner. So having something that I could make quick for my family, it's either that or picking something up. And, you know, if that gets expensive, and not that good for you. Also, sometimes mom gets sick, and you still have to feed the family. The family still needs to eat. I know moms that their kids are coming in and, you know, full enough to get up and make their dinner. So it's nice to have some foods that not only are easy, but that your family knows how to make. So when mom's sick, they can take care of everything. Um, also, how many of you, about, you know, you're all busy during the day, and you look at the clock, and it's 5 o'clock, and you have no idea what you want to make. Okay, that's usually what I call my husband. Where's my husband? Somewhere. Here, somewhere. I call my husband and say, honey, can you go buy a bowl of on the way home? Okay. So you don't want to do that because it's expensive and it's getting really expensive. It's amazing how expensive things are. Um, okay, there's also longer family challenges. Things like a new baby. When a new baby comes home, it takes two to three months to get back into a normal rhythm, doesn't it? Our new baby's up all the time. Especially if you have other children, you're losing sleep, but you still need to eat. There's also things like being out of a job. And your family still wants to be able to eat, especially things that they're used to eating because there's already a lot of stress in the house. Um, you can have a very sick child that you're at the hospital with. And the family back home still needs to eat. My friend had um, a young mom in her ward that just died from cancer and leaving five young children. And there, she'd been sick for quite a while, but we're even bringing food in. And she got to be pretty good friends with the family and found out that food was coming in, but the kids weren't really eating it because they wanted mom's food. So what we're going to talk about tonight is a way that you can take good food for your family at all different times so that they're able to deal with things. You also might have a mother, an older mother or a grandparent that comes to live with you, and they take a lot of time to take care of them. You don't necessarily have the you know hour or two that you used to spending on cooking dinner. So that is why fresh and freezer meals are so important because there are things that when you um, you know she's like sneaking, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> don't fuck, look, she's picking it off. It's her favorite thing. Okay, um, things from your refrigerator, things from your garden, and things from your freezer all go into this category. So it's basically things like you normally eat. We normally are eating things using fresh and frozen <coughs> things, right? And some canned and long-term stuff. Um, the freezer meals are great because when you're making one, you can just make two and put one in the freezer. There, are, If you Google freezer meals, there is oh, hundreds and thousands of websites and, oh, and also Pinterest that have people out there that are doing this as a way of life. And there is all kinds of tips. You don't even have to buy books of what you can and can't freeze, what freezes well, how to freeze it, it's great. So I was not a believer in it because I'm all about, you know, when the big earthquake happens and the electricity's out, but most of the time, our everyday emergencies, you have your electricity. So why not plan for that? Your neighbor gets sick, you can just pop something in the oven and take it over to her. Okay? It's a great way of including this as part of your, of part of your preparedness plan. Because we need to be prepared for everything. Okay, next thing is long term. We have things like pandemics that can last like three months where if you, you need to stay home because if you don't stay home and you have to go out, you're now exposing yourself to whatever's out there, which could be deadly, and if you have to go back home, you're now exposing your family. So you want to be able to pull up in your own house so that that doesn't happen. There also can be things like Sandy, this is a picture from Sandy, that take longer than two to four weeks and you still need to eat during that time. And hopefully your food hasn't washed away. And so, you know, you're able to eat something that's, you know, fairly nutritious and fairly easy because you're busy doing other things. So for these, for you want shelf-stable meals. You want things that um, don't rely on electricity, that don't rely on, um, yeah, electricity, actually, because you don't want to rely on your freezer and your refrigerator stuff at that point. So the things like it's in a bag or dinner's in the jar or bread in a bag, she also has a meal called soup in a bag, where it's basically the end and me kinds of things, right? Where you just are your simple one pot and swirl, you can add water, you can add some canned things to them, and that's what that part of the thing is down there. Those are all my shelves, some of my shelf stable things. So 
They just give you an idea. There's a lot of things out there. Now, you also can do mixes, and both of these, the meals and mixes, is what we're going to talk about next month, so we're not going to really go into it. But they do save money. They save, there's less preservatives in them. You can personalize them for what your family, um, how big your family is and what your family likes, and any special dietary needs. Now, one thing that I have found for us is there are all these things out there that I can get, but they're not things that I normally eat, so they're not really my favorite kinds of things. And I'm guessing your families are pretty much the same way. So that's when you start looking at your family recipes and which ones can be converted into chef stable meals. I have one of my favorite soups. It's called pasta fagioli that I got from Karen Tolman. We ate dinner at our house tonight. She made it. I love it so much. We ate it three times the next week. And it used all, pretty much all fresh stuff. Well, I've converted it all into food storage now, and it's great. So I can have that once a month, all year long, and it's all shelf stable, and it's delicious, and I love it. So start looking at your family favorites and decide what you can turn into shelf stable. So now, I'm going to talk about the heat meat things, okay? How many of you have seen these at Costco's carrying them now, right? And I bet all you're wondering, gee, maybe I should pick up some of these. Okay, I'm going to tell you right now why. This is a, a three-month supply for four people. It costs about $3,500 for three months for four people. And um, the buckets, okay, one bucket. How many servings of food do you think is in here? How many meals do you think are in here? 62, it says 200 servings. When you read the small print in these, what you find out is a serving to them is a quarter cup of milk or a quarter cup of orange drink, or a half a cup of a main meal. So they all have one thing in common. There are some things that are good about them. They're all almost all freeze-dried. Pretty much every one of them are freeze-dried. They will store for about 25 years of stored inside. So they're stored cool. That one has 275 rooms in it. And that's only five gallon bucket. Okay. Most of them, all but one, in fact, of all, of all the ones that I um, investigated, only give you two meals a day, a breakfast and a main meal. Of those, the servings are very small. They're a half a cup, usually for breakfast, a cup for dinner. Now, I don't know how many of you only eat a, half a, cup, a cup and a half of food a day, but most males never do that. As teenagers will eat about triple that. And, um, and not only that, but when you're in a more stressful situation, you're more prone to eat more anyway. So these are very small meals. Um, there's very little variety in them, usually about five breakfasts and 12 main meals. That's on the high side of what they have as far as variety. There's very, very little fiber in them, which was very interesting to me. So now we're back into the same thing like the MREs, and they're going to cause problems for you. Because of that, of very little fiber, there's very little carbs in them. There's very few calories. Some of them only have 600 calories a day for your whole day of calories. They go up to 1,200 calories. That's the high side. The ones that are on the high side are ones that have some kind of bread or something with them. There's more carbs with them. Instead of just having any meals, they have carbs included with them. So if you are going to, and I'm not telling you not to store these, okay? Some people, this is just what they want to do. If you want to do that, that's great. Do make sure you taste them first. Um, but you're going to want to have some kind of carbs in addition to that, some kinds of bread, some cornbread, some, you know, anything that's going to give you those extra calories because you're not going to get enough in the, in the, those kind of meals. Okay? Also, think about how much water. They're 50-50 water to food for these. So you are going to be at least doubling the amount of water that you need to have stored. They are very expensive. They run between two and four hundred dollars per person. A family of four could cost five thousand dollars for three months. Okay, now you know we can do a little MREs for you know ten bucks a day. That's a lot cheaper for four people. All right. So, in my opinion, we don't store these except for the two weeks of emergency food. It was a big eye opener when I started doing research on these. I was shocked at how one of the uh, I think it's Wise Foods, don't quote me on this, but I think it's Wise Foods, one of their commercials is like, oh, this is your three month supply for a family of five. I looked into it, it was like, I could not believe, it was like on the low side of everything, so little food. It was shocking. All right, so, now, 
We're going to talk about planning your three months supply. And this is where it starts getting a little overwhelming for most of us to start thinking about actually putting this together. So we're going to break it down. We're going to do more planning and easy. So what you're going to do, this is step number one, okay? You are going to pick six breakfasts or six main meals for breakfast and dinner. Okay, two meals a day. We're going to start with two meals a day. Six breakfasts and 15 main meals. Just because I think you like more variety in our main meals. Now, whether you pick six or whether you're 15, I don't care. You're just going to multiply it by that to get your 90 days. So if you have six breakfasts, you're going to have 15 oatmeals, 15 muffins, 15 cold cereals, 15 roll bars, okay? 15 days of those for each of those, and that gives you your 90 days of breakfast. And for dinner, you'll have six of each of the meals, and then you'll have 90 days. Are you understanding? Okay, everyone on the same page? Okay. Now, after you do your two main meals, now you can add in lunch, and you can add in snacks. And you, the same principle applies. Six times 15. Now, if you want to get a little fancier, and you want a little bit more variety, you can move to a 30-day menu, and you have three of those. And I like to do them by um, theme. My, my days are by theme. So I have like a Mexican day, and a favorites day, and a soup day, and a casserole day, and a pasta day, and a sandwich day, and an end of the day. That's the day that I can, um, that I can, you know, experiment. I can try things that I don't really like it. I can order a pizza, because that happens sometimes. So it's a way to try. Now you'll notice what's on here are not so much food storage rules, so just ignore what it actually says in the writing. <laughs> but it just gives you an idea. The other thing that's interesting about the 30-day menus is that um, if you think about it, we have we usually eat two different ways, right? We eat like warm weather foods and cold weather foods. We don't eat a lot of soups in the summertime. We don't eat a lot of salads in the wintertime. So following my same pattern, I can have spaghetti or I can have pasta salad in the summertime. So I can kind of use the same things, whether it's summer or winter. And you can just repeat the, you can just repeat that. That can be your six-month calendar for, you know, warm weather and have another one for cold weather. Just thinking how much time you're going to save by having less meals. Oh, look, there we go, planning. Let's start fresh. Okay. So the benefits of meal planning are that, number one, you get your family involved. And everybody knows if your kids especially are involved in doing something, they're much more likely to eat it and participate. I have a friend, she has a five-year-old daughter. Thursdays is the night that she gets to plan and help cook dinner. And that's getting her used to cooking in the kitchen. Um, it makes it not so overwhelming for mom because it's a planned day. She doesn't come in every day and try to help, which can get a little bit overwhelming. She has a planned day that she comes in. It's always something simple that she can help do. But I've been in the house when she's cooked, they even do dessert, and she's done a pretty good job of it. Um, it saves time because you're now doing, instead of having to come up with a new menu every few weeks, you've got one now that can last you six months if you do it that way. Um, there's no more fretting. When it comes to five o'clock, you don't have to worry because you'll know what's, you know, you know what's on the menu, you know what's coming up. What I do is when I have my menu, I'll look at it in the morning or the night before and decide what I want. I don't always, always stick to the exact days things are on because sometimes I'm in the mood for Mexican and it's not Mexican. So I might switch things around. But I already have all the ingredients in the house, no matter where it is, I can make it because it's on my menu. Um, I get more variety that way. You can have like a chicken day and a beef day and you know, work it out that way so you've got everything kind of laid out. Um, the menus are reusable. They save money because why? You can shop sales, you can use coupons, you can stock up when, because you know, gee, the next six months I'm having spaghetti once a month, and so you can buy six months with spaghetti stuff when it's on sale. It makes it so much easier and cheaper to shop. And you only will be buying what you need. My friend calls it assigning every food a job. So whenever she buys broccoli, she knows broccoli is going for broccoli soup and it's going for stir fry. And when she looks at the broccoli, that's what she thinks about. So she never has to wonder, gee, what am I going to do with that? Because it's already assigned to something before she even buys it. All right, so planning for your family. You want to use a combination of methods, okay? We've talked about fresh stuff and frozen stuff and canned stuff, right? We, when you talk about canned stuff, you can, I mean, you, let's say chicken. I'm using, like, the taco soup tonight, okay? I didn't have chicken in it and didn't it. Chili, okay. Um, so I have a taco soup recipe that uses chicken. I can use canned chicken that I buy. I can use home canned chicken. I can use fresh chicken. I can use frozen chicken. I can use 
one different kind of chicken. But it's all, you know, it depends on what I have on hand. If I don't have anything else, I use canned. If I have fresh or frozen, I would use that. So you can use a combination of those methods. Um, you want to try recipes to figure out what's good, what's bad, and what's bland. Things that um, are good are things you want to keep. Things that are bad, you're like so so bad, like the dog won't even eat it kind of bad, you don't want to try again. You want to get rid of that recipe. But things that are bland, that have promise, like the, did you like the meatball soup tonight? Okay, so that is something that had no seasoning in it at all when I got the recipe. And all I did was add the chipotle cubes and some basil and oregano and pepper. And that totally made, it was delicious. I am going to eat that on a, I had a lunch day, which was really good. Okay. Um, you want to change the ingredients that fit your taste. If it's something like the chipotle and you don't really like chipotle or it's too spicy, then we talked about put tomato in it instead. So you can kind of switch things around and fix what your family likes. Like my husband hates mushrooms, so I don't do things with mushrooms. Um, and you can package the recipes to fit your family size. Next month, when we do the packaging, we're doing the oatmeal, you know, for four days. Well, that's fine. You can just take out, you know, a quarter cup and do it for one person. But, like, what if you only had two people in your family, so you only wanted to do your cornbread in a loaf pan? You could actually cut that recipe in half and only package half of it and do it in a loaf pan instead of a 9 by 9 and then you could have it for two of you. So there's a lot of things you can do when you're packaging your own meals to be able to fit it more to your size. All right, so extra drinking water. Um, let's say that you have 90, or you have your two weeks worth of water, right? But let's say you think you need water longer than two weeks. If you don't have extra barrels stored, like I really, um, I'm a big believer in three barrels per person. That's a three month supply of water, and I'm comfortable with that. So if you can do more than that, I say do more. You can never have too much water stored as far as I'm concerned. Um, if you do not have water stored, that means you're going to need to treat water. And this is going to be a really fast course in this. To treat water, you need to do a couple of things. You need to purify it, which means to kill all the bunnies. Okay? That's all the things that can make you sick. You need to remove the bacteria, which is the removing the bacteria and the virus is killing those. And you want to remove the chemicals and you want to make it taste good, right? You don't want water to taste disgusting because who wants to drink that? That's why you store like tang and things like that to put in your water. Because sometimes when water's gross and then you'll drink it more. And at least your kids will. Okay, if you don't have a way to treat the water, you need to boil your water. You only need to boil your water. You actually only need to bring your water up to a boil. You do not even need to boil it. Right? As soon as you start seeing bubbles, it's good. You also, you actually only need to bring it to, I believe it's 160 degrees, is what kills um, all of the stuff. And you can actually do that in your solar ovens. And for those of you who don't, do you know what this is? Who knows what that WAPI. is? WAPI. WAPI. Okay, WAPI is W-A-P-I. I forgot what it stands for. Water Purification something. something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the A is. Yeah. Okay, anyway, it is this little clear plastic tube that has soy wax in it. And you'll notice it has, see right here? That's a weight. And so you put it in so that the wax is at the top in your water and it just floats in the water. That makes it sink. When the water reaches, gets up to 160 degrees, it melts and it goes to the bottom. And you know that your water is sanitized and safe to drink. It's like, they're like six bucks of the coolest little things. So you can do it all kinds of things. That way you don't have to watch to see how high your water is getting if you're not boiling it. Yeah. Are those waters reusable? Yes. You can use them over and over and over. Good question. Yeah. To reuse them, you're just going to flip them over. You can't really tell. But you see this right here? It actually moves, and so your weight can go to the top or the bottom so it flips. <laughs> okay. The thing about boiling water is, number one, it does not get rid of any chemicals or change the taste. All it does is kill the, the buttons. It doesn't do anything for taste, looks, or anything else. So, if you're planning to change the taste and the look of your water and get rid of the chemicals, you need to have a way to filter it. There's a lot of good filters out there. I brought one tonight. This is that homemade one. It costs about $50, and it does about 3,000 gallons of water. Um, with that one, because it's not a really high-end one, I probably would still treat my water with something, either with bleach or you know, something, before I ran it through there. I do have one of these ones, too. A big Berkey, which is like the catalog of water things on the market, and the water tastes good, and it does like uh, how many gallons it does. It has four, it can do up 
up to four filters in a given, I think it's 2,500 gallons per filter. And it will, it can do like three gallons an hour. If you have a family, I believe in getting, these are called um, gravity fed filters. And that is what I think you should have for family because your water stores down here in the bottom. You can, you know, keep refilling the top of it. You know, you'll keep water down here. These ones you have to pump, so it's a little bit longer process to be able to, you know, get your water through for a family. And plus, you know, you can just use it. A lot of people just use these for their everyday water now because there's so much junk in our water. And it's a lot cheaper than buying bottled water. Okay, so level two action plan. Make, oh my gosh. All right, a 90-day menu. Gather your food, your fresh frozen, your store bowl. Do it one meal at a time so you're not too overwhelmed. Use a menu and pra practice mix perfect. Store more water and get a good water filter. Okay, we're going to have to be really fast. Okay, level three. Long-term food storage, okay? Level three is the basics. The basics is, actually right now, the basics is 400 pounds of grains and 600 pounds of beans. 60. Oh, 60. Not 600. <laughs> 60. Okay, this is the more expanded version. Oops, this. Um, this has oil and milk and sugar and yeast and salt. That was not have yeast, but salt. That's a little bit more realistic for uh, basics. You can do a little bit more with than just beans and grains, which you really can't make a whole lot of. Um, as far as storing, you want to store them either in buckets or in cans. Or you can also store them in two-liter bottles. You can put oxygen absorbers in there, and they store really good. But you know, once again, we're back to the like, high. Actually, that was a pretty fancy way that they store them. But I just don't want to mess with that. But you might if you want to. Um, oops. You can also store in Milo bags, in buckets. Milo bags have to be in something else because they can, even some insects can eat through them. So you have to store them in something else. Um, you do not want to store them in their original bags because I had like 2,500 pounds of food that got invested because I did not get it in buckets and cans. So it got fed to my friend's chickens and so you don't want to learn from my mistake, don't keep it in the bags. I know a lot of people in Utah, they, there are bags like the wheat bags that say like to store in or whatever. But if there's a disaster, one of the things that first happen that happens right away is a lot of rodents and insects come out of nowhere. It's like they come out from the middle of the earth or something, and they will eat through that stuff. So just don't chance it. Okay. Next. Okay. So storing. Um, this is a shed that's totally insulated. I have my grains. Actually, we'll store them in the garage too. They actually store pretty good out there. Um, but there are some things that don't store good out there, and, but grains do actually pretty good. Um, you can store them in your garage too, these are in your garage. And you do not want to store them, however, in a metal shed, just because they get too hot. Okay, so level three action plan. Level three was really fast, huh? We like that. Okay, so buy your basics, your grains and your beans first. Then add your milk and your oil and your salt and your sugar. And you can do that either all at once or a little bit at a time. The one thing that's cool about your long-term basics is they store for like 30 years. So they don't have to be rotated, so it's really not such a big deal if you get them all at one time. You buy all your oil at one time, it's a little bit bigger deal because it only stores about two years for most oil, olive oil, and short bean actually store longer than that. But um, and there's some other ones that store longer than that, but oil, you want to stay for a little bit, so you don't have to replace all at once. Um, get it one bucket at a time or all at once, and variety is important. In other words, don't get 400 pounds of wheat. Okay, get some oats, get some rice, get some barley, get some other things. And for your beans, do the same thing. Get some variety in them, because every kind of grain has a little bit different things in it that are going to be. Okay. See, there's variety over there. And then store what you like. This is my pasta example. I love penne pasta. And I do not like macaroni. And so I don't get all the ch all the Bishop's Warehouse has is spaghetti, which I don't like either. I like angel dinner. It cooks faster too, so mm -hmm. it's better for food storage. So I get my pasta usually at Sam's Club because they have it like in five pound containers and I can just pour it in my buckets and I have my genitals on them and I'm rotating it because it's all pasta that I use. So whatever it is that you're buying, make sure that you actually are going to eat it before you buy it. Okay, so. One thing about
about um, the basics is it's cheap, it's easy, and it stores for over 20 years. It's about $246 for one person for a whole year of basics. Okay, that's cheap. And that's only about $20 a month. Um, so, not so bad, you can afford that. But, it makes very plain, very boring So now we're moving on to, uh, also, survival mode. It's not, it's only right now with just the beans and rice, if you don't add the other stuff to it, it's only 1,300 calories a day. So it's not very many calories. It is actually less food than they took on the hand cart companies when they crossed the plains. That just makes you think, doesn't it? Okay. So level four is turning your basics into meals. And also, once you've done that, that you move on to storing some extra stuff so that you're able to share with other people. All right, so the others. The others are things like seasonings and sauces and fruits and vegetables and meats. It's the things that make your basics complete meals, right? There's really nothing else but those that are going to make your complete meals. Um, seasonings are things like um, pasta. If you've got plain pasta as part of your food storage, you might get to eat it plain. Plain pasta is really not very good, especially in abundance, not to that little piece of the time. So spaghetti sauce or alfredo sauce or some kind of sauce to be able to put on your pasta or even your rice. Having bouillon to be able to cook your rice in flavors your rice up really good and it makes it yummy and even putting gravy on your rice is delicious. You can also have things like, I have um, dried potatoes as part of my food storage. I have ketchup because I like ketchup on my fried potatoes. So there's a lot of different things out there that just having some seasoning makes a huge difference. Having some seasoning makes a difference of having plain beans and rice or having like red beans and rice with some spice in the Cajun style. Okay? All of it is a little bit of seasoning. So think about, we're going, we're going to go back to, when you're thinking about this whole thing, your mini planning. Now you can, once you get past your 90 days, you can expand this into a year with your basics and just doing it one meal at a time. I think I skipped ahead, but that's okay. So fruits and vegetables. These are all different kinds of fruits and vegetables that can be part of your storage. There's canned, bought canned, store, or home canned, home dehydrated, dehydrated that you buy, and freeze dried. Now, some of you may not know the difference, so we are going to have a little lesson about that. Dehydrated fruits, dehydrated foods, are wrinkly and shrunken and hard. If you come up here afterwards, I have an example of dehydrated corn and freeze dried corn. The freeze dried corn looks like regular corn and it tastes like candy. It just pops in your mouth. You can just pop some in and eat it if you can try it if you like. In fact, I encourage that. The other, the dehydrated corn, you do not probably want to pop in your mouth. You may break a tooth, so don't do that because you said that for a while. They're really hard. Because of that, there you can fit almost four times in one number tin can, as like one number tin can is equal to three and a half freeze dried beans. Okay, it takes up a lot of space. We're gonna see a visual on that in a minute. Okay. Okay, it's sweeter and more concentrated. The flavor in dehydrated stuff is very sweet. How many of you home dehydrated or have home dehydrated? The stuff is delicious. I do not even like fresh pears and fresh dehydrated, fresh dehydrated, that sort of food. The dehydrated pears, we just spice them dehydrated. I can eat like probably a lot of calories with them because they're very, very sweet. So they're very good. And home dehydrated stuff is really, really good, which brings us up to that you can dehydrate. You cannot freeze dry, but you can dehydrate. So it's a way to add some extra things to your storage. Okay, freeze dry are all these different things. So you can get fruits and vegetables and meals and meatballs and cheese all freeze dry. And it's real cheese. It's delicious. Okay. So, the thing about freeze dried is the food stays the original size because they just freeze it in the original size and it's, you know, evaporate the water off and it stays right the same size. It's very lightweight. Like a whole number 10 can will only weigh like ounces, it won't even weigh a pound. Um, they're really good to eat raw, but if you eat very many of them, you need to drink a lot of water because it will soak up the water in your system to rehydrate, which can make you sick if you don't drink enough water with it. Um, they are, oh, long-term, okay, long-term. So what happens with freeze-dried stuff is once you open the can, 
Um, even in the high desert, they soak up any moisture in the air, and they very quickly will go from crunchy to mushy. And so, when you, if you're not going to go through a number two can really fast, you need to like repackage it into something else so that it doesn't get mushy, because then you're not going to lose it. Um, now, this is the thing about freeze dried to me. Freeze dried does not have very much taste, um, especially the vegetables. The fruits, the only fruits that I really like are, hold on, the berries, all the berries are good, freeze dried berries are really good, but like apples and bananas and peaches, we have peaches up here for you to try, they just don't have much flavor. I bought some freeze dried stuff from Costco, um, fruits, it was apples and strawberries and bananas, and they tasted like styrofoam. They were awful. The, the, they were terrible. So if you're going to get fruits and vegetables except for berries, I would stick with dehydrated stuff either bought or freeze dried or canned. In fact, I would suggest having a combination of all those kinds of things. You really don't want all freeze dried stuff or dehydrated because you need a lot of water. Okay, so, oh, meat and cheese are also good. Freeze dried, I tried some freeze dried uh, chicken about a month ago. It tasted just like fresh chicken with the water on it. So, and the same with cheese, just put a little bit of water on it. It's like shredded cheese. So those are the things that I recommend for freeze dried. There are a couple of vegetables that I like, the peas and corn. They're the only vegetables that I like are freeze dried. So, you can take my word for it, you can try it yourself. Okay. Alright, so getting the most from your Here's a comparison. Um, I think, I, I forgot, I should have wrote on here, but I don't remember how many servings this is for. I think it was for 90 servings, but I could be wrong. So, it's half cup servings. It would be 28 cans of peas are equal to one number 10 can of dehydrated peas or three and a half freeze dried peas. So that's all the same amount of half cups. So you can see how one dehydrated can will take up a whole lot less space in your house than all of those cans. <coughs> Plus you have to rotate them a lot more. But you still are going to want some stuff can because it's already dehydrated and you know. But make sure it's stuff you eat because if you don't rotate it, then you know, it doesn't do any good. Okay. Speaking of rotating, canned stuff does not need to be thrown out at the expiration date. Okay? If it's not bulging or it's not leaking, it is safe to eat. Doesn't mean it's going to taste that good, especially if it's been stored at high heat for long periods of time, but it will be safe to eat. You know, you see the movie Bowls, he eats a hundred year old peaches. Okay. Yeah, I mean, all right. Okay, the meats. The meats come in a drop in a, similar to the fruits and vegetables. You can get them already canned. Okay? You can can them yourself. Or you can get them freeze dried. You even can get bacon canned or canned yourself. You can get bacon. You can get, um, I think that's is that meatballs. Oh, sausage. It's sausage. And, oh, that's meatballs. Is that meatballs? Yeah, it's sausage. Okay. So, this is the interesting thing about all this. So, if I'm going to home can, I can get, like, Zaycon chickens coming in in a couple of weeks. It's $1.79 a pound for a hormone-free chicken breast. And I, so, if I already have my own jars, for a dollar, or for the price of a lid, I can can, so for under $2, I can can a pound of chicken. If okay. you have a pressure can. Yeah, if you have a pressure can. Don't do it with the water bath can. No, don't do it with the water bath can. That would be really a bad idea. Read my canning class if you need to learn how to can. There's a lot of videos out there of how to, and how to can these. Um, a can like this of chicken is equal to about a pound of fresh chicken, once it's you know, cooked down. And, but it's about two fifty or three fifty a can, depending on where you get it from. Um, or I can get it freeze dried, it's about ten dollars a pound. Okay, <laughs> big difference in price. It's a reconstituted pound. Because it's only like not even a pound of the It's a constant. Okay. So, so you see that there's a difference. And you also see that just like we talked about having different kinds of meals, you're going to want different kinds of meats as part of your storage. I personally suggest if you want meats as part of your storage, learn how to can, get a pressure canner, or or find borrow one. My board just bought one. The Relief Society just bought one, and they are starting canning classes because they really want the sisters to get their 90 day supply. And that is the cheapest way to do it. Plus, like I just did ham, which you can't really buy canned ham anymore. Well, you can, but it's weird. So, yeah. Well, that's charged in the first place. What do you do? 
Well, I have mine stored underneath the bed, but it's pretty stable, so I'm hoping it's going to be okay. But that's why I don't have it all that way. That's why I have a different kind of lace. Because you're right. Okay, we're like out of time, so I'm going to go in hurry. All right, so all cans are not created equal. Now, this is a really important part of the lesson today. If you are buying freeze-dried or dehydrated things from different companies, you will find that every, you will think like, oh, it's a number 10 can of chicken and a number 10 can of chicken, and this one's cheaper, so I'm this one. This one has less in it. Sometimes some companies, when they have sales, their sale cans will have less in them than their regular cans. So you have to really watch the ounces that are in the cans when you buy them and compare ounces to ounces and not just prices. Um, okay. So you also want to check the serving size. Sometimes they have the weird serving size. You think you're getting like 100 you know, servings in something and it's really only like 20. And different companies have the same size can with roughly the same amount of um, of ounces in them, and they have completely different serving sizes. I have no idea why that is, and I don't know which company's right, but it's weird. Um, can sizes. A, a number two and a half can is the same size, same size as a quart. It's also called a pantry can, and it's also called something else from one of the other companies now has a new name. So they'll have different names for the same size can. So you have to, it's to throw you off. So you have to pay attention. The number 10 can is, which thankful they don't really have any other names for that yet, um, is a gallon size can. It's like a gallon of paint. That's the size that it is. You can get these in pouches. Sometimes they're little. They're taste size pouches. And sometimes they're in, you know, like five pound kind of pouches. So you got to look at that too. You want to check the ingredients. My friend has a can of, a number 10 can of beer and air sauce. The number one ingredient is sugar. Okay, so watch the ingredients. And you also, when you're comparing things, look at the shipping rates. Some of them are way higher than others. Okay, next. I'm sorry, we're going over. Okay, so store this way, not that way. You, all of the freeze dried stuff needs to be stored in the house or at cooler temperatures. If you store it outside and it gets over 70 degrees, then it drops the taste of your food very, very quickly. Like within a month, you'll see a difference in your food. So you need to keep it cooler. Um, some ways that you can store, these are cases that you can store. There's, she's got shelves with bungee cords across, so it hopefully keeps them on the shelf. Um, you also can get these cool crates now to put them in. So they're kind of expensive though, but they are kind of cool. They only come with forks right now. Yeah. And so you don't, this is the not this. You don't want to store your can stuff on a shelf, not, you know, that they just go flying anywhere. Okay, so where do you put it? Here's some ideas for storing, because this is one of the questions I would get to. I don't know where to put it all. This is a trash can that she has um, her three-day supply of stuff in. She puts a top on it, and it's just her end table. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a closet that they've turned into a pantry. This is another closet that's got, that they have put shelves in and have can stuff in. This is my friends here, their house. Um, it's a trailer. They've actually added a four-inch shelf all the way to the length of their hallway, and that has cans stored on it, or, or mason jars. Mm -hmm. um, this is in a bedroom, like the back side of a closet that's not getting used. Okay, this is behind a couch. So I'm going to show you two different ways. This is buckets and boxes with a shelf on top, or this is just cases that are stacked on top of each other. They put a thing over it, the couch is up against it, and that's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. The food storage behind. You also, I, didn't, I don't have a picture of it in here because I've said it so many times. These are all different ideas that I had before. You can put a year supply of basics underneath a twin size bed. You can double that under a king size bed. So even under beds, if you just you know raise them or just use that for underneath, you can double stack them and not have a box and have a two year supply in there. Okay, this is, anyone know what this is going to be? This is going to be a desk. So see how they put it? So there's foot room and you know room to put things, and this is what it looks like when it's all done. Hmm. Okay, if you're lucky, you can turn a whole extra bedroom into a storage room for your house, for your family. Okay, level four action plan. You want to expand your menu by one, by one meal at a time, using and rotating it, making a recipe book so you have all your recipes in one place, and um, 
Oh, share shopping. That means you know. Share shopping for sharing. Okay, so where do you find the money? These are all things that you could give up to be able to save your food storage. Okay, stop going out to eat. You know, do food storage for gifts. Have garage sales and sell all that junk that's in your house you don't need it anyway. Anyway, um, stop going to the movies or just have a movie night at home. You can um, have a staycation. There's a lot of cute pictures for that. Um, get rid of your cable. Getting rid of cable, you can get a, you can get um, your basics for I think it's like my cable is like eighty dollars a month. That's for four. That's every month I can get my storage for four people just by getting rid of my cable. Okay, some other things. One of the things that's really important to do is to set aside some money into a savings account, budgeting every month ten, at least $10 per person for your emergency stuff. It will work and then that money is safe for you to be able to use. Another thing and the most important thing is really to pray because Heavenly Father wants you to be prepared. The more you're in connection with Him, the more He'll be able to help you and help miracles happen. Okay, so food storage. Tonight I'm giving you a lot of tools to be able to work on your food storage. I'm guessing you learned a lot of new information, probably too much. Um, one level at a time. So remember, starting your 72-hour kits and water, and then two weeks, and then 90 days, and then a basic year supply, and then the others. One level at a time, so it's not so overwhelming. And get together with your friends and family and make it happen. Food storage, I know it, I live it, I love it. I know it. I know that it's not for just the big one. I know that it's food insurance. It protects me in every day. It can protect me every day. It is it's done correctly. It's a great investment. It's healthier. It saves time and money. I never run out, and I'm able to help others. I'm able to live it. You don't want to waste. Oh, you want to buy it and use it so that you're prepared for anything. You want to do it. Isn't that a gross picture? Sorry. One bite at a time. <laughs> I thought it was a great idea until I looked at the picture. I'm like, okay, we're going to move right on to one bite at a time. Okay. Um, it, I want you to think of food storage as a journey, not a destination. You never really are done with food storage ever because there's always something else out there to help you improve, to help you learn, to help you move on to something else. And to, lo to love it. Um, I have not always loved food storage. I've always had food storage, but I haven't always loved food storage. Now, I take great pride in having a food storage dinner. Um, practice does make perfect. It's not always so easy to learn how to cook with food storage, but the more you do it, the easier it's going to get. Food storage really can, as you can see tonight, can taste really good. It does save time, if you, you know, especially with the things we learned tonight. And, that's all. Um, so tonight we learned about store this, not that. And we learned lots of tools. We've also learned that the world is changing. It is best, and you'll be happiest and more at peace if you are able to deal with the things that are coming down the road. If you prepare temporally and you prepare spiritually, you'll be able to handle anything that comes along. It is really through having the confirmation of the Holy Ghost and having that connection with Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ that you will be able to feel peace with everything that's happening in the world. No matter what happens, you'll feel that peace. Oops, that's it. So I hope that you all learned a lot tonight. I um, I learned a lot. I learned way more than I could share with you and I shared 10 minutes too much already. Um, but I loved doing it. I love the fact that I learned what to store and what not to store because that helps me save money and helps me get things that my family is really going to like to use and it helps me feel prepared and that all helps me feel peace and I hope that helps you feel peace too. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.